So um, thank you so much. And uh, I think it was a pleasure listening to Dr. Stewart. Um, and I'll try and uh, address the orphan drugs. Um, they, they are a very disease company. So my name is Gertie Kelsey. So let me just first check whether my voice is audible so, um, uh, so that I can carry on speaking at this volume. So can you hear me? I, thank you. But it's breaking up a little bit. Okay. So um, I think I won't be able to do much about the breaking up because that's an internet connection issue. Uh, so we are a rare disease company. I'm the chief medical officer with this club, and Pharmaceuticals. We are in the congenital heart disease area uh, for kids who undergo repair and they are on prolonged. Uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and also subsequently once they are moved from theater they are on um, uh, protracted periods on ventilatory support so we treat that condition to try and prevent acute lung injuries besides that we are working on a sickle cell disease um, another orphan indication but it moves from pediatrics to adolescents and to adults, as uh, most of you in the rare disease space would know. In addition, we are in um, uh, strokes, uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we also do atrial fibrillation. And uh, more recently, um, with COVID-19, we're now trialing within the hospitalized patient population to try and uh, impact on uh, diminishing the dependency on uh, ventilators so that if that works then i think that will be our contribution to science so um i'd like to begin with an overview um and we know that there are increasing number of diseases being classified as rare diseases. So we have over 7,000 diseases and affecting 350 million people worldwide and around 30 million Americans for that matter. Um, for any drug to be classified as an orphan, it has to affect less than 200,000 people according to the US definition. Uh, many of these uh, conditions are genetic and uh, they could be uh, multiple genetic deficiencies uh, in a given condition as we have seen in our population we have a lot of down syndrome kids who end up having in general heart disease and they have a multitude of other anomalies this is an area which is very underserved and to develop treatments it's very much more expensive than some people may be aware of. On an average, of course, the conventional drug development takes about $2.7 billion is the last figure I've seen. Um, in the rare disease space, it is also creeping into, you know, closer to half a million, uh, half a billion to sometimes even more than that. So it all depends. More than 40 orphan drugs exceed um, one billion dollars um, in um, revenue. Uh, just give me a second. I'm having a little problem with my screen here. Okay. Two hundred fifty new rare diseases have been identified every year, and worldwide orphan drug market is uh, at about one hundred twenty-seven billion dollars as per twenty eighteen data, and it's growing at eleven percent every year. Uh, 
going through 2024, uh, compared to 6% for non-orphans. So to set the scene, the ODA provides the underlying legal basis for uh, assigning an orphan drug designation or status. An orphan drug designation is based on disease or condition and is not on the basis of an indication. So usually that's where a lot of, lot of people get caught up in a back and forth with agencies because the um, agencies require a clear articulation of the disease or condition that the drug is treating, diagnosing, or preventing. But once you're through that hurdle, there are development incentives and tax credits to treat rare diseases, both in the pediatric population as well as in adults. And there are also uh, benefits in terms of the PDUFA fee. Um, it can be north of $2 million. There are no exemptions from standard regulatory requirements. That point has to be made clear. Um, and the FDA Policy Council set up the Orphan Drug Modernization Plan, and the scope of which is to look at all the designation reviews and look at also the subsequent uh, rare pediatric disease priority review vouchers, which is one of the attractions in rare disease spaces, RPD, PRVs. And it also covers the orphan exclusivity and other guidances. The further details are available under Fidesia 2012 and Fedara 2017 for those who wish to uh, look into the details. So what's involved in the orphan drug designation grant? What's the criteria? And as I mentioned, I'll repeat a little, to prevent, to diagnose, or to treat. So a rare disease includes the pediatric subpopulation, and you could even have within a, within a pediatric subpopulation, you could see a signal in a subset, in a subpopulation. And that could also be your um, um, eligible for the grant criteria. So this is how we view the world in, in terms of orphan drug designations. Um, the FDA modernization plan will address some backlogs that they have and adhere to a 90 day review timeline. Um, so if people are concerned about review timelines, I think um, the FDA is doing a tremendous job here in trying to prevent any delays from occurring. So the, here is um, a detail around the incentives and uh, in the grant program, you get eligible to up to $14 million per year, which is broken down here for three to four years between two to $400,000 per year. And this then gets followed up by a recomplete process and based on additional supporting clinical data. Tax credits, um, they cover up to 50% of the clinical trial costs. And then you have the use of e-waiver that I just mentioned for rare disease therapies. There is the market exclusivity for seven years following market approval. And this is to do with the US side. Rare pediatric disease voucher program um, the important things to remember here are that the decision has to be within six months after filing instead of 10 months. And the RPD candidates are eligible for a PRV. Uh, you just have to notify the FDA with the intent at least 90 days prior to redemption, transfer, or selling to another sponsor. We've had one product in the market which is for urea uh, cycle disorders. Um, it's in the bile disorder area. And so that we um, sold to a, a partner company. So it came with a voucher. So I think this is how things can work out. So 
sometimes if you don't have your own in-house commercial uh, facilities, which we didn't at that time. The other strategic options for orphan drug development are based on which area you're working in. So you could go down the path of uh, the, you know, the GAINS Act, which covers the Qualified Infectious Disease Product Designation. Um, and that can give you an additional five years of market exclusivity. And it also serves the purpose of priority review fast track designation. And you could have, um, for your new drug development, you could also go down the path of a rolling review, uh, also a component of the fast track designation, but it requires supportive non-clinical data. And then we have the breakthrough designation, which is a, um, requiring you to demonstrate that the drug is um, treating serious life-threatening disease and, more importantly, has a substantial improvement on one or more clinical endpoints compared to the standard of care. And you can use surrogates or intermediates for uh, clinical benefit. But these surrogates and intermediates have to be agreed upon upfront with the FDA. This slide shows you. Sorry. Hello? Yeah, there's a bit of background noise, but uh, I'm not sure what it is. Um, this slide shows you the orphan expedited and rare trends. And what it shows you is that the number of rare diseases is going up and uh, over the years. The second point to make here is the um, expedited review status granted, that particular trend is showing that it is fluctuating. Um, and more so with the orphan drug state is granted, that also is um, fluctuating. But I think more and more companies are getting into this space, including uh, the big pharma. Here you can see the drug sales from uh, 2018 to 24. And the couple of points to make here is that the CAGR for even the large top 12 um, orphan drug companies uh, it's getting into double digits, as you notice, from 18 to 24 period. And there's a rising market share as well um, happening here. The other point to make is one fifth of the worldwide prescription sales are now to rare diseases. Now, the challenge we have in this space is that um, this shows you an example of Luxterna which is at $425,000 per eye. So the mean cost for a patient per year of, is um, quite expensive. And if you look at the top 100 orphans, it's uh, averaging at around $150,000 plus in 2018 versus $33,000 for non-orphans. So that's one thing we, we have to address when it comes to uh, pricing and reimbursement aspects of uh, uh, rare drug um, developments. So here are some strategic considerations. Um, you should partner very early with the FDA. Ideally, go for a SPA, a special protocol agreement. Um, it will hold you in good stead. Um, the orphan de designation grant should be applied for with the OOPD very early. Um, and of course, uh, in this relationship on a spa, you have several advantages for a dialogue with the FDA. In the clinical development side, leading up to registration, um, there are many things one can do in terms of uh, fast tracking uh, based on um, drug design. They typically involve smaller phase threes um, but you have to be very, very cautious in trying to pick up the treatment effect that you're targeting uh, um, and look at the sample size um, based on that and use, if possible, adaptive uh, considerations 
but allow for how they may require you to uh, analyze your data. Uh, so all of this is an interplay between the uh, strategic biostats input and uh, clinical developers in a company, and of course the regulatory uh, component. The requirements are very similar as per standard drugs. Um, so I don't think you can um, gain any mileage from thinking that this will cut corners in some ways. Only thing you can do is you can reduce uh, your, uh, um, you can have a seamless design, phase one, two, and then come up with a phase three. Usually the regulators prefer that you have two randomized controlled trials um, at a p-value of 0.05, but if you have just the one, uh, the p-value will be, the alpha will be tighter. So you have to uh, make sure that you discuss this uh, upfront during the spa meetings and agree to a realistic uh, uh, ambition. Here's a comparison between European Union and the US. And it's clearly showing you that uh, in terms of incentives, there is a difference in that EU has 10 years market exclusivity, uh, so three years more than the US. There's some definitional differences in terms of prevalence. And um, in terms of the exclusivity reviews, they occur in the EU after five years if prevalence changes. In the US, there's no change. And the timelines are 90 day comp plus 30 day EC on the European side. And there are no timelines for the US side. Procedurally, there are some differences as well. And the um, centralized procedure, uh, which is EU wide. So that's, that's a very big advantage uh, when um, going for orphan designation and subsequent approval for clinical development. So some development considerations, apply early in the development cycle, seek scientific advice, make sure that you have all your questions answered during the scientific advice, um, and implement the scientific advice into the um, drug design. Fee reductions for marketing authorization and maintenance, they are also something you have to plan very much early on. Um, grants and tax reductions, 10 years market exclusive, these are given, but you have to still make sure that they're part of your plans. And especially pricing advantages. So this is where the rubber meets the road in how you will ensure, as I said earlier, the one downside with rare diseases is that it can be very expensive. So you've got to make sure that you have this, the, the evidence backing the pricing. The accelerated pathways review times 150 days, and it applies to all major health interests. Um, you should have a pre-submission meeting with the European Medicine Agency at least six months before submission. And there is a prime priority medicine 2016 part program that Europe conducts for early clinical benefits. So challenges in development, um, there are quite a few. I won't be able to go through all of them uh, in detail, but I think you should be looking at the phases of development right from one to four upfront. So prepare a full clinical development plan rather than go trial by trial because then you see the rationalization uh, and the outcomes within each phase. The design considerations are multitude. The more ones which are more common are the RCTs, but in some cases, based on the indication, you could even have an open label, um, especially if you are considering the phase four, um, expanded access, main patient access, things like that. There's also the safety element that gets captured in a registry pathway or a post-authorization safety study. And clinical endpoints, we must make sure that we've got them all um, uh, cleared by the FDA. 
the HUR plan, a lot of the times in rare diseases, we do not pay much attention to the HUR plan early on in development. Um, but at the latest, you must in the phase three stage. The SAP should be, the statistical analysis plan should be pre-planned. Um, anything which is done post hoc is now very well accepted by any of the agencies, unless you have very good grounds for a, uh, a signal within a subset and you can prove that it was a, a prior intention. IP strategy process has to be followed rigorously. Um, filing strategy, um, commercial strategy. So all of these um, strategies need to be interlinked and uh, they shouldn't be in working in silos. The publication plans, the thought leadership, and all the launch plan side of it. On the operational side, there's a lot of things here. I think the most important thing is recruitment strategy because we suffer in rare diseases if we don't pay attention to the uh, pre-planned recruitment strategy. It, one has to ensure patient engagement, that's the key. And a lot of the times what I've seen in my experience is that a physician to physician contact really is very much the way to go. Establishing relationships at all levels helps in um, um, meeting our recruitment goals. So some medical commercial perspectives, um, health economics is playing a bigger, bigger role than it ever did before. And it's important to plan that with uh, knowing what the uh, treatment burden, the cost burden is very early on and planning the outcomes research roadmaps um, fairly in um, um, partnership with uh, uh, even the regulator. I, I mean, the real world evidence people now, the analysts within the FDA are very keen on partnering. So value-based healthcare is taking center stage. And so it is important to consider what the payers, the providers, and the patients want whilst you're designing the programs rather than having to fit in later on. So this is the optimized pathway. I'm sure everyone has seen this before, so I won't labor the points here. They are just as a summary. And with that, I conclude. This is a picture of where we are located in Baltimore. We just um, um, by the um, a beautiful view we have from our offices. Our offices are right at the bottom right hand side building. And thank you. I'm open to any questions.